From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. Who does it take to launch a global movement, unite politicians across the board, and start a national conversation on human dignity and freedom? Britney Spears is fighting to free herself from a decade-long conservatorship under her father, James. And yesterday, she might have gotten herself a milestone win when an L.A. court judge agreed to let the pop star choose her own lawyer. This has happened a month after Britney's personal testimony in court caused shockwaves, revealing the conditions she was living under and making it clear that she wants out. Her situation has launched a global Free Britney movement by her fans, a documentary, and now Capitol Hill has joined the fan base with prominent politicians pushing for more oversight on the guardianship system, which has long been criticized for being a little murky. On the question of the conservatorship, I am squarely and unequivocally in the camp of Free Britney. I think this is friggin' ridiculous. So today we try to find out just how do these conservatorships work in the U.S. and was a pop icon's cry for help loud enough to amplify an important question? How much is too much when it comes to legal intervention? We use Britney because of her celebrity, because it puts a face and a voice on this, because there are thousands, we estimate 10,000 a year, victims who never get talked about in the news. Joining me to explain all of this is Professor Nina Cohn. She's a law professor at New York Syracuse University. She's an expert on elder law and conservatorships. And in 2018, she gave a detailed testimony to the U.S. Senate on the potential dangers of this legal arrangement. Hello, Professor Cohn. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. It's wonderful to be here. Let's start with helping us Canadians get a bit of a clearer picture. What exactly is a conservatorship? What's the intended purpose? And in what kind of situations do they usually come into effect? Sure. So conservatorship is essentially another name for guardianship. And it's a court process that allows a court to appoint somebody to make decisions for another person. If that other person doesn't have the ability to make their own decisions and is therefore at some risk of harm. And the purpose of conservatorship is really to provide for some way to make decisions on behalf of someone who, because of their limitations, cannot do so for themselves, and there's no other less restrictive way to get their needs met. So it does have its place, but it should be used extraordinarily sparingly because it also strips a person of their right to make at least some decisions for themselves, and that's a really drastic remedy. As I began researching this, I found out that this is not new. Long before Britney Spears brought this into such high public and media focus, this has been a conversation and has been debated in Congress as well. And I believe you were a part of that. Could you talk to me a little bit about the background? Sure. So there's been a long-standing effort to reform guardianship and conservatorship law and practice in the United States. In fact, there's been a pretty significant reform effort dating all the way back to the late 1980s, really focused on putting protections in place, encouraging more limited appointments where any appointment is being made, and improving monitoring. But a lot more still needs to be done. So how many people in the U.S. are potentially under some form of this? Do we have enough data to get a clear picture of how people's lives might be impacted? We have a really woeful lack of good data on guardianship and conservatorship in the U.S. Best estimates suggest that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half million people in the U.S. who are subject to guardianship or conservatorship. And I mean adults. There's also guardianship and conservatorship for minors. That's a little bit different. Now, the people who are appointed in these arrangements can be family members. They can be friends. They can be professionals who do this as part of their work, 
Typically, the person who petitions for a guardianship or a conservatorship is the one who gets appointed, but that need not be the case. That said, just to be fair here, we actually know remarkably little about how these arrangements are working on their ground and exactly who's in them, why, and what the impact is. Right. And are there any benefits to a conservatorship? Are there cases where this kind of legal arrangement is perhaps necessary? Or is it all a bit of a gray area because we are basically talking about another person's autonomy and dignity in many ways? Sure. It's a great question. Unfortunately, there are some times when a guardianship or conservatorship is the best option for an individual because the individual is experiencing harm or is at substantial risk of some really real harm and they can't make decisions for themselves and there's no other less restrictive way to meet their needs. So I can give you a couple examples if that would be helpful. Please. Okay, so let's imagine two. Let's imagine that we have an individual who has very severe Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, that individual never appointed anyone to make decisions for them if they couldn't. And maybe now the person is at risk of being evicted because they aren't paying their rent and nobody has authority to pay it. Or maybe their current home doesn't work for them and they need to move to an alternative situation, but nobody has the ability to help them do that or make those decisions. Or there's no one available to make healthcare decisions for them it may be the best option to protect that person's wishes and to protect their interest to appoint somebody for them. And, you know, a guardian or conservator does have the advantage of being a fiduciary. So they owe a very high degree of loyalty and a very high degree of care. And they come with some level of court monitoring. The other example I should probably give is a situation where maybe the person has done some advanced planning. You know, they did what I would recommend they do as an elder law attorney. They appointed somebody to make health care decisions for them if they couldn't do it for themselves. They appointed somebody to make financial decisions. But unfortunately, the best laid plans didn't work out. So, you know, I'll use myself as an example. Imagine I appoint my husband as my agent, my nephew as a backup. My husband dies. My nephew, unfortunately, is untrustworthy and he starts exploiting me. Maybe he has a substance abuse problem. Who knows the reason? It's something I didn't anticipate. Now, how do we meet my needs? It may be that I no longer have the capacity to understand what my needs are or know who I could appoint. And so sometimes when that best laid plans go awry, then a guardianship or conservatorship may be the best option, unfortunately. Right. The first time I sort of became familiar with this concept was when I remember seeing this film, I Care A Lot. That was horrifying for me. You know, you remember it was about a twisted lady exploiting old people through this conservatorship system. And I didn't really know this was a thing. And this was probably the first time I started actually getting nightmares about what's going to happen when I get older and incapacitated and, you know, what I was going to do or how that would work. So how close to reality was that film? Okay, that's a great question. So it's a fiction, right? It does not reflect the reality on the ground, but it's not as far fetched as you might hope. You know, we do unfortunately have outdated laws in this country that enable pretty significant exploitation. You know, so to look at some of the tricks The Guardian played in that movie, and for folks who haven't seen it, it is a good movie. One of the tricks is that The Guardian petitions for guardianship without telling her elderly Mark. And unfortunately, in the U.S., state guardianship laws routinely permit courts to appoint emergency guardians without notice to either the individual who's alleged to need one or family and friends who might come to their defense. And even when state laws say that individuals are entitled to notice before a guardian is appointed, courts can and do waive giving that notice. And so you even have long-term guardians as well who can be appointed without the subject of the proceeding being present in court. So real big issues there. And we could also look at some of the other tricks. You know, the protagonist in this, Marla, if I remember correctly, places her victim in a nursing home and sells her house. This is a really big deal. But unfortunately, in most states, such moves are considered routine and they don't require specific court approval to make them. And so you see this type of placement abuse being done. And then, you know, another trick played in the movie is really getting the court to ignore very clear evidence of wrongdoing. And we know that in the U.S., and we're not the only ones, but certainly in the U.S., courts 
routinely fail to provide adequate monitoring of guardians. It's a long-standing problem, and it leaves really vulnerable individuals at risk. Right, less room for accountability. So, Professor Cohen, even in this context, when we think about arrangements like this, we're talking of elderly people or completely incapacitated people. Let's talk about what's going on right now. Is Britney Spears, with her decade-long powerful public profile, her career, and her age, is she a typical candidate? Absolutely not. So most individuals who end up subject to a guardianship or conservatorship petition are older adults with progressive cognitive decline, think dementia, or younger adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. So Ms. Spears is not a typical individual in many ways, but in one of the ways that she's not typical is she's not the typical subject of a guardianship proceeding. We'll be right back. And one of the commonalities might be, I don't know if it's so much concerns about someone's finances or assets being potentially exploited. That might not even be the case from what I've seen. But what is the emotional and psychological toll of this kind of arrangement on anyone? It's a distinct snatching away of control. Absolutely. So it can be a very stigmatizing and traumatizing process, both the initial court process and the ongoing appointment. And that's one of the reasons it really must be understood as an intervention of last resort. And I will say we also know that an individual's sense of control over his or her own life is correlated with emotional and physical well-being. And those who perceive themselves to have control over their life tend to report higher levels of satisfaction and experience better health overall. During this conversation, I've heard you say guardianship or conservatorship, and I believe there's a bit of confusion about that as well. A lot of experts I've heard have been saying what's happening to Brittany is a much more rigid form of control and is more like a guardianship. Sometimes these two terms are being used interchangeably. Is there any difference between the two? Yeah, so we have some significant terminology confusion here in the U.S., and that reflects in part that guardianship and conservatorship law is state-based. And states use different terms to refer to the same thing. So some states will use the term guardian to refer to somebody who's appointed to make personal decisions for another person and conservator to refer to a person who's appointed to make financial decisions for another person. Some states will use the term guardian to refer to both types of appointments. Alas, there is one state only one, that uses the term conservator to refer to both appointments over personal affairs and financial affairs. And that state, you guessed it, it's California. I was going to say. (laughs) So that's why you're hearing the term conservator used in the Spears case. Ms. Spears has a conservator appointed for her person and a conservator appointed for her estate. And I do want to get into that a little bit California seems to have a sort of unique situation around conservatorship laws. So did that play a role in how Britney's situation came about in the first place? Well, there are some very outdated aspects of California law that may well be contributing to the problems we're seeing in this case. And one is that California allows appointments with limited process and evaluation where they are what are so-called voluntary conservatorships. That is where the conservatorship is done with the apparent consent of the individual. And experts, I think, have pretty long agreed that that's a really problematic approach and that courts should not be empowered to strip a person of their legal rights unless it is truly necessary. And thus allowing less process and less evaluation where the individual says they consent to the arrangement really opens the door to coercion and to an unnecessary stripping of people's rights. You know, another big problem that I think we're seeing playing out in this case, and this is a problem in California law, is that California's current law can be read as allowing a lawyer for a person in Ms. Spears' situation to advocate not for the person's wishes, but for what the lawyer thinks is in their interest. Now, that's pretty inconsistent with the role of a lawyer. It's pretty inconsistent with lawyers' general ethical duties. And I think it's also quite inconsistent with the rights that all people in the U.S. have under our federal constitution. 
But as written, there does seem to be some confusion about the role of the lawyer and the potential for an individual to be stuck in an arrangement without anybody to truly advocate for what they want. And Brittany also said recently that under her conservativeship, she's not been allowed to have children or get married. And she mentioned she was forced to work once with 104 degree temperature. That sounds extremely problematic from a basic human rights perspective to many. Is that typically the kind of life and death power that can be held over someone in that arrangement? So this is extraordinarily concerning, and it raises really two legal concerns. One is what types of powers should a guardian or conservator be given in the first place? And there's a real problem in the U.S. that guardians and conservators are routinely given more powers than they really need to meet the individual's need. And one way courts and law reformers have tried to deal with that is to encourage only very limited appointments and then to identify certain powers which either a court cannot strip or they can only strip with a specific finding. Marriage rights, procreation rights tend to fall into those hot power categories. The other issue this raises, though, is what is really the duty of a person who's been appointed a guardian and conservator. Can that person just do what they think makes sense? Or do they have to take into consideration the individual's own preferences, own wishes? And a modern understanding of a guardianship and conservatorship law and practice would recognize that really the role of the person appointed is to make the decisions that the individual would make if they were able to. So ignoring what that person wants, ignoring what that person prefers, that is really inconsistent with the basic fundamental duties of the conservator. And one of the reasons you and I are also having this conversation is because of Britney Spears. And we're seeing how hard it's been for Britney, who has so much power and resources compared to someone who wouldn't have that profile. And most people in the situation wouldn't have even this kind of access. So how challenging is it for someone to try and get this sort of arrangement removed? And what are the venues available to them? Well, this is ironically one of the situations in which having a lot of fame and money may not be to your advantage. Because where there is a lot of money at stake, there's more incentive for individuals such as the conservator or such as other entities that the conservator may contract with lawyers, accountants, and so forth to try to continue that conservatorship long after it's needed because there is money to be made by its continuance. And so I wouldn't necessarily think that those factors are actually working to Ms. Spears' advantage. They may be very much working to her disadvantage advantage. That said, it is true that it is typically far too hard to end a conservatorship or guardianship or to change who is appointed or exactly what powers they have. And that's why I've been engaged in some law reform efforts really are trying to make it easier to do this. You know, we can talk about what some of those reforms might look like, but it's really an area where we need to be sitting down and saying, well, how do we change these systems to make it easier for people to get out from under this type of appointment? Right. And I researched, you've been talking about this and writing about this for a while, but now we're seeing prominent leaders across the political spectrum from Elizabeth Warren to Ted Cruz pushing for more scrutiny and an overhaul of this practice after we're hearing about Britney Spears' story. So do you see that working to help not just her case, but to tackle this whole issue of conservatorship? And what are some of the immediate remedies that you think can be implemented? So I think we have real potential now for some really positive change in this area. And so I hope that this will bring attention to what could be done. And here's the good news. I mean, the good news is that the Uniform Law Commission has created model legislation for the states that they could adopt that would address many of the key problems with the systems, including the ones I have identified, and would help create systems incentives to encourage the use of less restrictive alternatives to improve oversight. I actually had the honor of serving as the reporter for that legislation. And I'm really hopeful that Spears' case will create the interest and momentum for state to finally adopt the legislation. A couple of years back, the U.S. Special Senate Committee on Aging recommended all states implement the act to reduce abuse. The Fourth National Guardianship Summit, which was convened at my home institution, Syracuse University in May, recommended the same. 
But the need for reform has not been fully appreciated in the states. And there hasn't really been strong public demand for it. So I'm hoping that the Spears case will help change that and help the public see why this is something they should be asking from their elected representatives. Thank you so much. It's been such a delight talking to you, Professor Cohen. Really appreciate you helping us understand all of this. My pleasure. That was my conversation with Professor Nina Cohn, an expert on conservatorships and a Syracuse law professor. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by SoCalled, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 